Uh, now, they always say, if you want something done, ask a busy man. So we're absolutely delighted that uh, Aradazi has found time in his very busy schedule to come and talk to us uh, to see some old friends again, and I guess reconnect with a lot of fantastic leadership for work that he started. We owe him a huge debt for the huge amount of work he put in, and I'm delighted to welcome him back again, Thank Aradazi. Thank you, Phil. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Phil. Thank you for your very, very warm words, actually. And uh, nice to be back. Nice to be back with all the friends and colleagues in London. Uh, you're probably saying, why? Why me again? And I asked myself that question, to be honest. Uh, I thought I've done and dusted as far as uh, health reform, policy, uh, and I did promise myself everything I'll do will be outside. But let me just tell you how it happened. Uh, 2007, when we launched the report, and there are many, many faces here who remember that day. Uh, sadly, immediately after the launch of the London Framework for Action, the amount of work that went into the London Framework for Action, uh, the amount of engagement that went into it was phenomenal from my perspective. It was, if you like, the, the, the icon of reform in terms of looking at the whole change based on pathways of care. Uh, from the cradle to the grave. And that was very, very engaging and very, very stimulating. And in many ways, also highlighted to the government then that reform should be evidence-based. And uh, so leaving all of that and going to a very interesting place uh, for two years, uh, leaving many, many friends and colleagues. Uh, so that was one factor. The second factor is what happened in 2010 when more or less the brakes were put on in relation to the London Framework for Action uh, for all sorts of political reasons, sadly. And, uh, and despite that, I felt at the time that many, many leaders in London went underground and continued to do the work because they felt very much engaged in what was happening. And uh, so the idea when Boris approached me to do this or look at this again was many, in many ways a vote of confidence in what you, and London has done uh, since the London Framework for Action. So I took that on, and I very much hope that we can reignite that huge interest in change, that huge interest in improving both health and healthcare, uh, uh, the, uh, in many ways celebrating them some of the great successes that you've seen, I mean, the stroke care, trauma care, a number of other things, but at the same time being realistic of some of the major challenges that are facing us. There are a few slides that have been prepared for me, uh, just purely cues about what we're planning to do. This thing was launched in September, if you remember. We, the first commission meant, uh, met in December of last year, early in December. We put up the call for evidence, and we've received a significant amount of uh, uh, reports uh, uh, it's interesting the different stakeholders that engaged in this, including NGOs, Cleaner Air is one example that I came across. Uh, we've extended that further. Uh, we did one of these evidence hearing sessions, which was transmitted live, if you remember. We had some interesting characters from Stephen Dorrell, people from the past, and people of the future. We're looking at those, we're analyzing them, and uh, we're trying to develop some of the themes that are coming out from the different uh, uh, reports we received. And we very much hope to have a draft report in July, take it out for, uh, again, consultation, and then finally publish this report in uh, sometime in autumn. I pick up my words, I'll become a civil servant, autumn. I can't tell you exactly when, uh, <laughs> but we hopefully will find a date that will fit all the interested parties. It is independent, and I'm very, very keen to keep it independent and, uh, uh, in many ways. And, and I do chair the commission, but the commission is many, in many ways advising me of what should be in this report. Uh, it's very much looking and examining all the challenges in terms of the health and well-being, uh, in terms of the challenges facing health care, and they are astronomical and certainly looking uh, from the health and wealth agenda, considering the vibrant uh, contribution that uh, London makes uh, to the national economy. 
Uh, engagement is an extremely important part of this, so thank you for having me here, and, uh, and I'm very, very keen to seek your advice. How else could we engage more and more and penetrate through as granular as we can as far as getting the views of both all the stakeholders involved, not just the NHS, uh, local government, the business sector, uh, and, uh, and, and, and NGOs, and so on and so forth. So what are we trying to look at more specifically? There are bits of work that I think we need to look at a little bit more carefully. Interesting, you know, reforming health care systems in urban cities and 50% of the population now are living in, 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 in cities is, is becoming an interesting uh, subject to look at. If you look at some of the major cities like New York, what Bloomberg managed to achieve in New York, although Bloomberg had a completely different set of powers in New York, uh, there are some very, very interesting examples there we can learn from. Uh, we're looking at a number of other cities across the globe. Uh, we also know, and I think if really take you back to the London Framework for Action, whatever happens in London, it's very much a first mover what may happen in the rest of the country. So it's something we should be proud of in many ways uh, because People do look at London, although there is many, many jealousies when it comes to London, and I've witnessed that in the past in relation to the funding levels uh, and where London sits, but uh, London does lead the way when it comes to change. Uh, the other important factor here, which was quite attractive to me, was how do we leverage the mayor? Mayor, with all of his attributes, uh, how could we get him more involved? I mean, in many ways, it was actually quite refreshing because, you know, Boris completely distanced himself from health for the first term, I think, but his interest is complete revival and interest in health, and I truly means that. I'm very, very, uh, I was very taken back by this, and I think where we are structurally, the mayor having a say uh, and, and, in many ways, taking the leadership of that change, I think, also has a significant potential. So we're connecting, we're engaging with Londoners. I think we're looking at London's strengths, and there are many, many strengths. Uh, take the university sector, take the financial sector, the economy, certainly the university sector. We really made the academic health sciences centers and networks work. Uh, how could we use them at a better vehicle in, in transformational change? Uh, looking at some of our successes in the past. How did we make the stroke changes? Uh, and another interesting question that came from the call of evidence is that the person who led all the uh, stroke reforms is, we've got to a place, but there's still plenty to do. In actual fact, there were even concerns that we might be stepping back, uh, backwards if we're not careful. So a lot to learn from what succeeded. And what are the things that didn't succeed? My famous polyclinics would be a good example of that. And uh, you know uh, what went wrong there? And uh, the business model, was that the right model? Did we actually engage primary care? Did we provide primary care with the right leverage in making that change happen? So there are some still uh, interesting questions that need uh, evidence-based answers. Uh, taking more of a global view, I made a reference to that, and, uh, and then you know, ultimately, this report will come up at the end of, uh, end of, in autumn of this year. The question is, where is the leadership in driving that change? There's plenty of leadership, but is it coordinated leadership? And we're hearing all sorts of different uh, uh, ideas. If you look at the call for evidence, there's a very, very strong emphasis on the health and well-being. Very, very powerful, very, very strong. That's coming from within London, and I know Yvonne is leading on that, and there are some... Uh, we, we met recently, some, uh, some very powerful uh, evidence-based uh, policies that we're looking at. The question is, how do we make those happen? How do we scale them up within London? Uh, uh, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about this. Integration of care, and I know you've had an amazing session today, and you've easily seen some examples from overseas. Uh, Sadly, I find this word integrated care slightly contaminated. A lot of people have been talking about it for the last three or four years. The question is, how do you make it happen? What does it look like in real terms? Is it integration with health and social care, or is it actually integration between health and education, another very important one? 
And we talk about integration very much within the need of chronic disease, but you have to remember what, what I, the messages I'm getting quite clearly, there are two, uh, uh, the two major challenges is mostly the elderly and chronic disease, but also children. Uh, it's one area in London that I think we've been very much left behind, and I think important to stratify our populations and look at those a little bit more carefully and what we can do uh, in driving change. Information technology or technology, you know, things have moved on so dramatically. Uh, recently, we had a, a Dragon's Den competition uh, in coming up with apps that could help deliver better quality and a safer care. And there's a huge interest, actually, with the <coughs> trainees and all sorts of other workers who are coming up with some fantastic ideas and really driving the uptake of simple, what I call frugal innovations that could make significant change. And my men's mindset has changed. Most of you will know me. I, was, I spend most of my life on high cost, low impact technologies like robotics and moving into uh, more uh, uh, high impact and low cost innovations. Applying innovation, which is the biggest challenge facing us, you know, uh, and, and the gap which is getting bigger and bigger between what we know we're actually reasonably good now, certainly in London, in generating that evidence base uh, from our three AHSCs, from our biomedical research centers. But what remains a significant challenge is translating that evidence into clinical practice. You find ways of doing that, you probably deserve a Nobel Prize. And that's the challenge that continues to, uh, in, in many ways, is the enemy of reform or change. So these were my thoughts. Uh, I think Stephen told me to just very briefly to go through. I'm really, you know, Phil was very kind and said, I'm happy to take questions, but I'm more interested in getting ideas and comments from you uh, and delighted to answer questions. Uh, but if we can spend a bit of time, I think the panel have very kindly agreed that I will eat into their time, which I'm happy to do. Eating into the panel's time. Big round of applause yep. for Ara. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I just ask you one question before we tap into the expertise? I'm yep. really interested in, to, in the mental health of our leaders. Leadership is absolutely crucial. I suspect over the next 15 months, things might get a bit childish and adversarial politically. Yep. Yep. What's your advice for leaders at the top end when things get unpleasant politically? I mean, the only thing I could say currently out there, there isn't a big political idea right. or political leadership in changing health. And I don't think there is the appetite either, to be honest, for structural change. But I think there is a, you know, what do we do next? Uh, and I don't think there is that big idea there. And in many ways, that actually could be exceptionally beneficial. Because mm. if you do have the right ideas, practical ideas that we can drive through, I think it's probably the best time to do that. We know some of the external factors. There is no more money. It's quite clear. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a no appetite for structural change. <coughs> and they're the big things that political announcements are based on, uh, if you look at the last decade. So they are dependent on what happens at, at the level we're all sitting here, which is the local, which is the local leadership in driving, in driving that change. Uh, and, you know, the last year, I haven't heard anything other than mid-staff. And, uh, you know, there isn't, you know, there isn't the thing that is going to turn this ship around and say, in actual fact, this is where we are. And it's not a bad thing for London because we could do our own thing. Good. I might be naive, but that's the way I see it. You're still optimistic. I am. Always Excellent. am. Yeah. Good. Well, we've got lots of talent here in the room. Who would like to ask Dara or venture a comment on what uh, Ara has said? How is though, uh, I chair Beckley CCG and I've known Ara from a previous time when I was uh, a member of parliament on the Health Select Committee and worked very closely with Ara on a number of occasions over a number of years. Where did you stand on polyclinics? <laughs> Pass. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, problem I, the, the problem I've got with, and this is not a thought rather than a question, is that there are all sorts of perverse drivers in the NHS at the moment which really do get in the way of transformational change. On the one hand, you mentioned mid-staffs, and you're absolutely right. And if we're not very careful, we're going to have some more mid-staffs as, as the money gets tighter and tighter. So the natural, the natural sort of reaction to that 
is to is to put more money into secondary care to sort of beef up A and E departments to you know to get rid of some of these immediate crises. But Anne made a point this morning, and that is that we currently spend 94% of our health budget in hospitals in London and 6% in general practice. We also heard from our NATO allies across the pond that the only way to transform care is to bring healthcare up front. Primary care development is the absolute answer to, pre to prevent secondary care uh, and mm. tertiary care down the line. So you know, we heard time and time and time again. Mm. The dichotomy we've got is how do you stop more mid stuff's happening, but at the same time, we have to transfer large sums of money from secondary care into primary care. And I, I was just doing some sums. You know, if, if we spend 6% of health, health spending on, on the NH, on, on primary care, and primary care sees 90% of, uh, of consultations, it means that hospitals are 150 times more expensive than primary care. If anyone can do the math, double check that. I did, do, I did work it out. It's 150 times more expensive to have somebody in hospital than it is to have it in primary care. So it, it's a no-brainer. And if we were to take 3% of that 94% to put it into primary care, there'd be a 50% increase in spending in primary care, which would transform it. But how politically do we make that relatively small change of a 3% shift without there being more staff, mid-staff, without there being wholesale you know, uh, problems in the, in the secondary sector? Yep. It's a long question, but it's quite a no, big topic. No, and it's the question that I failed, miserably failed to address in 2007. I said that in the beginning. I mean, we did make the case very, very strongly that primary care is where the investment should be going into, mm -hmm. even in the good times where we had the money. But we managed to completely dis you know, tangle it with all sorts of vested interest and all sorts of challenges. Uh, it's not that easy to reform primary care. Mm. So throwing money at it doesn't really work. We did throw money at it, as you probably do remember, in 2007. Do you remember the famous democratic process of throwing money in primary care, which was every PCT had to have one health center? Uh, and that created that in itself. So. There are all sorts of other dynamics and incentives in the systems which are completely misaligned. Uh, one of which is, I'm not sure how many primary care colleagues are here, is the estate, is the ownership of the estate, what incentives you have to release that, the contractual issues, uh, BMA discussions. So that needs leadership. That needs political leadership, uh, not just money. And at the same time, there is this big gorilla out there, which is secondary care, and especially in London. And change in London has never been easy, but you know the history of it, and you know the leadership of Anne or Ruth prior to that. Things did happen, but I think we need more. And I, you know, I've made a number of references, sadly, in a place like this. There is always that paradox between the politics of saving lives versus the politics of saving votes. And we need clinicians, we need people to stand up on platforms. And midst, if there's any positive thing out of MidStaff, that could be it. Uh, so the answer to your question is yes. I think everyone in this room would agree with that. How do we empower commissioners? Uh, uh, do we have, is, the Nash, is, is NHS England, or through Anne, do we have the right levers to do primary care commissioning better? Uh, I think we're getting, I'm seeing some fantastic examples of better commissioning of secondary care. Uh, that is maturing, but I'm not entirely sure we really got the grip on commissioning primary care. How do you feel about uh, Foundation Trust taking over primary care, as they're starting to do in some areas, where you have that vertical integration, they might take on a bit of social care. Uh, if they're the ones with a river surplus, would you see that working as one integrated care organisation? I, I think, you know, it's back to there's no one size fits all. I think in some areas that could be very attractive. But I don't think that is the solution for all the problems of integration. I really don't. I mean, that brings a new set of problems uh, of choice and competition, which was some of the main drivers of improving quality. But I think in some areas that might be reasonable. I think this is just um, an observation I've made from going around looking at different things. But I think about the move from acute care to community care is absolutely dependent on good integrated care being in the community because it's no good us saying we want things to go into the community if there aren't the resources and the and and and, and the infrastructure to actually manage it there and i think the challenge is the fact that you have a staggered starting line i think if you probably went around everybody in this room maybe in the you know in the whole of england and said do you do integrated care they'd say yes but when you scratch the surface, you find some areas have got real integrated services with whole systems approach. So if anybody hits any part of the system, they start going through an integrated pathway. 
Other ones have integration, but in like pockets. And you couldn't complain about them, but they are small. And therefore, the rest of the system has stayed the same. And I suppose what that does then is develop this staggered starting line. And the, I suppose the challenge is, you know, how do we make sure that we don't get dictated by the slowest person? Because the reality of the situation as far as I can see, is you're not going to get major shifts in the acute funding until all of those, because very often okay. acute hospitals deal with a large number of different boroughs or different areas. So how do we move people up quicker? Or how do we do that? And, you know, I, I put the Health and Wellbeing Board, I put, tar you know, but I mean, what, what's, what, what answers? I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that. Well, you're always going to get that. And, you know, there is pockets of excellence in around London. I mean, I, could I just say, I declare an interest, I do work in Northwest London, and there's a huge amount of talk in Northwest London, uh, integrated care pilot, uh, and, uh, and some of the fantastic work has been done. And then, if you remember, there was an external evaluation of this, and a paper that said, in actual fact, didn't make any difference, which, which I think it was very premature in its approach, in timing, in all aspects of it. Uh, but there's a lot to learn from there, and you're right, there are different... Uh, I think ultimately it comes back to is how do you bring and engage the whole community together to do more of a population-based approach, uh, and there's a lot to learn from that pilot. Uh, uh, could you transplant that elsewhere? I'm sure you can with some local changes, because the rest of London is very different than northwest London in every way possible. Where do you stand on patient empowerment? It was interesting that the chair of NICE recently, David Hazen, the new chair of NICE, said he wanted patients with sharp elbows to march into consulting rooms saying, here's the NICE quality standard for X, Y, and Z. I demand the standard of care. If you read the quality standard for patient experience, it's extraordinarily good. If every patient printed that out, laminated it, and took it into hospital and said, this is the quality standard that I should be getting, yeah. it's interesting, isn't it? Do you, do you ever foresee British patients actually having the the balls to actually start doing that? Well, Phil, we did that. In 2008, we came up with the quality framework. We talked about quality accounts. I don't know how many of this room will remember the quality accounts idea based on pathways. We should have metrics to measure those. We need to present those in a digestible format to the, uh, to the population out there and the patients and the public. Uh, in some places, they took it seriously. Provider organizations, I think both primary and secondary, came up with their quality accounts. Mm beside their set of financial accounts. Uh, and that did have an impact. There is no question about that. But I think there's a huge scope to do more and more. PROMS is a very good yeah. piece of information, patient-related outcome measures. You know, we now know that I think 55% of patients in this city having inguinal hernia repairs do not report improvements in their quality of life. That data should be presented and available to any patient coming in with a simple groin hernia. Mm. And the savings from that is huge as far as the financial side. So I think there's a huge scope to do that. I mean, you are the communication and the media person, is how do we get that? You know, you know, programs like you and what you have done to empower the patients and the consumer is, uh, is very important, still very challenging in, in this NHS. I was saying earlier, I'm a big fan of real-time patient experience as a smoke alarm for the NHS, yep. and also staff experience. Tracker. It's very good evidence that yep. staff experience is good care. And good. they even did research in America where people who were fairly health illiterate just did simple star ratings. Uh, and they found that actually even a star rating for somebody who understands very little about the health system correlated ultimately quite well with quality of care. So and you can uh, also say happy doctors, happy nurses means yes. happy patients. Yeah, absolutely. And question here. Can we get our... I can shout. You can, but the microphone's coming too. You could <laughs> shout. <laughs> um, really, just following on from that, I w was wondering... Um, do you think the Commission will create a different conversation with Londoners around their attitudes to care outside hospital? Because one of the things that I see as a CCG Chief Officer is that it doesn't matter how many great schemes you come up with to support people preventing admission and effectively getting them out of hospital, they think they're being shortchanged, they think they're not getting the best service and they think we're just doing it to try and save money. Yeah. And um, all the evidence suggests that you go into hospital, not necessarily the best things happen to you. Um, how do we change that and will the Commission deliver that, yeah. do you think? Well, the answer is whether the Commission will deliver that, I'll come back to. The answer is we have to have a completely new way 
of engaging the public in change in London. And, you know, I'm dependent. There's actually, we had four themes of work. We've just added the fifth one, which is about public engagement and how do you find what, what are what are the innovative ways in which we can engage the public and empower them with the change? In 2007, I took about 100 Londoners. I don't even remember the whole journey of eight mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. 100 is not good enough. You really need, and you know, in this world of social media and everything else that's available to us, so we have a number of people who are, you know, we're bringing some of the best best heads together to see how we can communicate that message. But by the problem with communicating with the pub public, beside the process of communication. From my perspective, there are some important principles that we tend to fail to do. One is, who is the messenger? That's extremely important. And we need more diversified messengers out there talking about this, not just the doctors and the nurses and the leaders in this room. Where are the public? Where are the patients who could stand up and speak? Where are the, all the other stakeholders that could actually communicate the message out there? The second is, you know, there's something about change, certainly shifting care or changing the nature of care in a secondary care provider. There's an issue of health security, and we haven't really cracked that. To do that, you really need to show the alternative. You need to show that it works. You need to have the clinical champions talking about it. And stroke would have been a very good example. I mean, stroke change was massive, absolutely massive. Mm -hmm. uh, we interviewed, I can't remember his name. Who's the chap who led the stroke changes in London? Uh, Tony, Rudd. Tony Rudd, yeah. He's a guy who, in actual fact, he lost the stroke services in the organization he was working in. That's leadership for you. Mm. But he stood up, he said, this is the change, this is how we're going to make it, and now we have some of the best outcomes in stroke in the world. Stroke change or transformation in London, we heard from another expert witness, is a case study in the Harvard Business School. Mm. of how to make change happen. So we can do it, but we don't know how to scale it up. We don't know how to do it in all sorts of other areas. Mm. There isn't anyone out there who will tell you that I've been to my primary care visit, what a wonderful experience, or you've come to, in my own institution, if you look at the patient experience uh, readings in cancer, you know, we rate some of the worst in the country. Uh, London has at least some of the worst patient experience rating in the country. Mm. And at the same time, we know we have some of the best outcomes in cancer in London. So there's a, how do you get those messages out? I remember, I don't know, remember a chap in the London Framework for Action, we had a, a very nice video uh, uh, of Murray Brennan from Memorial Strong Kettering, who was addressing the changes we were proposing in London. And he said he doesn't understand Londoners. Every Londoner commutes for about 30 minutes to 45 minutes to work. Uh, on an hour to work, why wouldn't you take half an hour to go to a hospital in which your outcomes from cancer are better? They're, they're the champions that we need to get out there. So, but you have to show the alternative. You really have to show that this is what you can do in primary community. Back to Howard's point, if you shift that, the outcome is better, more cost-effective and more efficient. Yes, question here and then here. Um, it's more a comment. Um, Ara, I was really delighted that you did mention um, children. And um, I'm actually an ex-pediatrician, now public health person. And I feel for London, if we really want to um, um, go and um, think what um, um, the assets are of um, um, London, then we cannot just always huddle together and talk about integration of health and social care. Because you also talk about wealth creation, and really the future is in um, um, our youngsters. And I, we had a very enlightened um, workshop, but to be honest, it was the converted huddling together. And um, when we're now opening up the forum, I can't really see the children's um, leadership exactly um, um, sort of... Um, um, voicing um, um, or showing their voice. So directors of children's services, for example, where are they? Um, um, schools, hugely important settings. So linking together the care and the prevention and the public health, yeah. the kids are, they need a bit more attention. I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, how do we get, how do we link with the education commission that the mayor did? How do we really transect those in health and education? And, you know, that is the future of London. 
And at the same time, to do that well, you need to keep your senior citizens well. And, and that's the read where I see the, the, the two sort of uh, age-based segmentation. Yeah. Okay, time for one last quick comment. Uh, do you think uh, CCGs could offer the clinical engagement to help implement the outcome of the London Health Commission? I very, very much hope so. Uh, I mean, you are the engines of change. And, you know, when I first started this, the first thing people said when I went to the, to the assembly, you know, where is the leadership? Should we recreate the SHAs? You've heard that debate going on and on and on. You know, I said, give the CCGs a time to mature. And, uh, and the answer is absolutely. I very much hope that you have at least felt through this process or feel through this process that you have ownership of this commission and its outputs. Excellent. Could I ask someone else some questions? Yeah, Could you I can. ask one question? Yes, of course you can. Go Just ask. give me your own thoughts and views. I mean, I'll keep about the leadership of change in London. Uh, Anne is doing a brilliant work, but you know, there's a lot of noise out there about what else do we need in London. Any thoughts on that? Please write to me. Well, how should the mayor contribute to this? You know, mayor is uh, an unbelievable character, a huge amount of charisma, uh, a great communicator when it comes, you know, if you want to get, put someone on stage to communicate the message. He's a great communicator. What else could he do in relation to this uh, commission, besides the CCGs, obviously? I'm a big fan of the idea of My Health London, and I think before we hand our data on to third parties, we should probably give it to patients first. Yeah. Let them correct their data. If you look at your medical records, you'll probably find quite fundamental errors in them, very commonly. You probably ought to correct those errors before you pass them on to third party. But the idea of My Health London and health communities Companies like Patients Know Best, yep. where people yeah. are getting their results back in real time, same time as they're a consultant, they're managing their diseases at home, they're avoiding a whole day parking in hospital because they're having online consultations. That has to be the future. The absolute empowerment of involving patients by saying, here's responsibility for your records. Uh, you can add stuff to your record, you can challenge stuff, you can correct mistakes, you can decide who has access to them. I think that's the thing that he could get behind. Yep. And if London was the first city to give people absolute access to their notes, quickly. That would be quite a challenge. Well, that would good. be my top tip. Uh, okay, fascinating. I've loved this. Thank you so much Thank you. for inviting me. Thank you. Big round of applause for Aragon. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I'd like to welcome Anne back on stage, who's going to round up for us. Thank you. Yep. I just wanted to respond to something Ara said about um, the politics, and there was a question. And some people here will be bored of hearing me talk about this story, but I think it's worth saying it because it's about how things have moved on in, in London. So I'll just quickly tell it. So one of the things that I see when we go, I go around the country um, uh, is that we have... Uh, the most distinctive and deep clinical leadership uh, in London. And maybe because lots of people here are part of that, um, they don't see it, uh, but I certainly see it. And what we have in terms of the Clinical Commissioning Council and all of the work of the CCGs and the Clinical Senate, um, all of which has... Aris had built, has built momentum over a number of years um, is something which is very, very distinctive. And we've also demonstrated the power of evidence. So next week, uh, no, not so week after next, we're going to publish the next audit um, of the um, emergency care standards. And what that's going to show is significant improvement in London against those those standards and yes it's going to show we've got a, a way to go but it shows that as a city working with clinical leaders we've established what good looks like and our institutions are moving towards that and the quick story I was going to tell you was that I found myself in a very odd situation about um, three or four months ago where, as many of you know, I used to be the Cluster Chief Exec in North West London, and then I took on this job. And I got a phone call, um, could I go to a, a meeting with a number of um, special advisors um, to talk about what uh, the politics were going to play on shaping health future in North West London. I don't think they quite made the link between my previous job and, and that. So I went into this um, meeting expecting and did indeed receive the politics that you might expect. But over the the, the uh, couple of months where we went backwards and forwards, 
the fact that all of the CCGs, the leadership there, were absolutely unequivocal and had dialogue with those politicians about what they wanted to achieve. And all of the medical directors in that part of London all stood up with their clinical commissioning colleagues and said, this is the evidence base, this is what is right for patients, allowed me in that political forum to say, which side do you want to be on when you stand up in the House? Do you want to be on the side of the argument that says these are uncomfortable changes but it's going with what clinicians are telling us are good? Or are you going to be on the side of, 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 of that you've not accepted it for political expediency because it involves A&E departments? And we ended up with what I thought was quite an historic statement by Jeremy Hunt in the House. Biggest change that has happened not only in London but, well, uh, hasn't happened but is, is um, uh, agreed to go forward. So I tell that story because I saw there that the politics moved on and often we talk about that that's just so difficult in London but I don't think we realise how clinical leadership working with the evidence has moved that on. So that's just a contribution to, to, to that debate. So I hope you've enjoyed today. I've been moving around um, and Lots of people have been saying they've been finding it really helpful. The next one of these is pl planned for early September. Um, so if you've got thoughts and ideas about what you would like to have in these sessions, they're, they're from you. Yes, it's my team that puts them on, and thank you to them uh, for all the work that they've done on, on this. But you you need to, to, to let us know. Can I also thank our colleagues at McKinsey, Martin and team, mm -hmm. who have um, hosted and helped us design this. They have put a lot of effort into this, so thank you to them. And thank you to Phil um, for uh, your facilitation and your jokes. You. And if people would like to join us for a drink afterwards, you're very welcome.